let's start. I'm going to go um, super middle first, actually, just with the check shirt. Thank you. We'll work backwards. Just scroll, it'll be fine. Can you give him a t shirt? Hi. <laughs> uh, first of all, Greg is great. Greg Murphy, thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, why the 70s? Because um, the film would have been really short if it was set now. <laughs> <laughs> or it would have to have a very long scene in the beginning going, should we meet down by the docks? Ah, oh, the docks, there's no fucking reception. <laughs> <laughs> No, 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 no. Jeez, it's not. Oh, oh. So that, that was one of the one of the reasons. Um, and then the other reason was it, I'd, um, as part of the research, in, I've been researching some other stuff about um, uh, kind of uh, the troubles and the, and the IRA in Boston, and, and, and I found a story about them smuggling back guns from the QE2, which I thought was really interesting. And they were going back to. Using the QE2 to take guns to Belfast and then they'd offload them the site. And I thought that was, there was something there that was quite interesting. And so that you could have a, like a crime film that didn't have any criminals in it. You know, you know so you didn't, you did not even like standard mafia and the Dean, you know, which had been going a million times. So that, that was part of it as well. And the clothes are cool. <laughs> <laughs> right, I want the next one to be for Sam. So. Oh, Sam. So what can you take that? Oh, here, thank you. I can hear you. So, people know the t-shirts, so question people. People ask questions, get a t-shirt? Yes. So, it's a large, no offence. It's all the so, sort of like knowing I'm quite like, particular in choosing our roles in previous films, what made you think about doing this film? Um, I wanted to, I'd seen um, Kill the List, was the first one of the best films I'd seen, and then I sort of went, went back, backwards and then forwards from there. And I'd asked my agent as soon as I'd seen Free Fire, because the lady who cast me in my very first film, Castle or Ben's films, and I was all, sort of, you know, why is she never offering me a role in one of his? I think I was replacing someone, wasn't I, actually? But we won't talk about that now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, and that was the sort of atmosphere when we all arrived there. You know, everyone, we're all quite nervous as you are today, but everyone really wanted to, although we'd all come from all sorts of parts of the world or whatever, we all, everyone just wanted to work with, uh, with Ben. No, that's a good idea. Yeah. You're sighted now. Yeah. yeah. That's, that was enough. <laughs> there won't be a sequel, so you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> right on that end. Uh, I uh, really love the film, by the way. Um, just wondering, when you were writing it, how did you manage to keep track of all the characters and where they were? Because just chaos on film, essentially. And how could you remember where everyone was? Um, it was done through, um, yeah, it was in, from the start it was going to be an issue, obviously, so the script was pretty detailed. And then from the script I had to draw it out, do a lot of storyboards for it, a lot of maps. Um, we ended up building it in Minecraft, was the other one. <laughs> <laughs> Well, this is the only 3D package I can use, you know. <laughs> um, it's very useful. I've done a lot of stuff with Minecraft. And, um, anyway, so um, to build in, build in Minecraft, and then I shared that with uh, we had our own server, and, and I could share that with Laurie Rose at the OP, and then we could walk around it together in our different houses and stuff. And, um, and then that was a kind of an excuse to tap into the budget to pay for loads of... Um, Kind of air fix kits and stuff, so I bought like models of the trucks and all the cars. It didn't help this, but it was just something I wanted to do. <laughs> and, then, um, and then set that up with, then we made um, scale models of the space. Um, and then when we finally got the actual warehouse, which was the, the, the warehouse wasn't wrecked like this, it was just a clean space, all the shit was brought in. Um, we built it initially with packing cases, like cardboard boxes, 
archive boxes and just put all the pillars and the walls in and just walk through every step of it just to make sure that um, it would work in terms of the eye lines. Because basically, my main fear was that you, because it's all shot in chronological order, you could get, you could start a mistake you make in week one, you might not discover until week five. And it's very difficult then if you suddenly you've got all these characters all over the place and then they can actually see each other or easily shoot each other, then it, then it just pulls the whole thing up. So a lot of it, all, all that stuff was kind of gone over and over with a fine tooth comb. So yeah, lots of plan. I won't come up on that balcony now, please. Um, well, you can choose. Hi, um, Greco, by the way. Uh, how did you manage to get Martin Scorsese involved? I mean, that must have been a bit of a fanboy moment. Yeah, it was pretty intense, that. I mean, I, 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 it, it started in very small kind of steps. And one of them was that he'd... Um, He'd been interviewed by the Telegraph while he was doing um, Hugo, shooting Hugo in the UK, and um, they said, "Oh, what have you been up to in the, at the weekends?" And he went, "Oh, I've been watching uh, British films, um, the, the contemporary British films." So he'd seen like um, Joanna Hogg's Archipelago, and he'd seen um, some of the, um, he'd seen like um, Red Road and Fish Tank and stuff like that. And he said he'd seen Kill This. So I saw that in the paper and I'm like, fuck me, why well, actually someone showed me when I buy the telegraph, but someone showed me because meant to be mentioned here. I was like, oh, shit. So I talked to my American agent and I was like, uh, you know, if you did one thing for me, <laughs> can I please, please leave my Scorsese? So I went, oh yeah, I said, we'll see if we sort it out. So when I did the press tour for Sightseers, I went to see him um, in his house. And um, which was really very intense indeed, you know. I kind of I've never met anyone that I'd read a book about or bought a big coffee table book about so, um, at great expense. And, um, and, and yeah, he was just everything I I hoped for our, over all the years of seeing him in interviews and stuff. He's like kind of he's very generous and warm, he's a encyclopedic knowledge of film was all there. And I was like chatting away and I was looking at him thinking, fuck, you were in that Kurosawa's dreams thing playing Van Gogh. Oh, you you know Kurosawa. He's <laughs> so, like, oh, you know everyone. Oh. And the other thing that was really weird is that, that you know, have a conversation with him. But my knowledge of film is all gleaned from books or from the internet or like reading stuff about the seventies. And he is the man. It's about you know. So you're having this very one-sided conversation. Where you go, oh yeah, I've got, I heard this thing. You know, and you have absolutely nothing to do with it. And you're talking to the direct source of it all. So, yeah, it was really intimidating and brilliant. But um, he, and then after that, he got on the right, and he I got an email from his company, his uh, production company, just to go, if you ever have any stuff you want to develop, then uh, pop it over to us. And so he sent them, sent them this, and they said, yeah. <laughs> so, that was great. Um, we'll get everyone from the balcony. I'd like to say, would the salmon from the balcony, please? I don't worry about that. Oh, fair. It's all about Ben. Nice. Well, I uh, was just wondering about the process of being directed by Ben and how tightly the comedy after that all of it was scripted and was there any room for improv? Well, I, rem- I remember the, f- the first one that I read was less funny. It was miserable, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Quite, it was quite a sort of grim thing. My agent said, you're in the first scene. He didn't realise that there's only one fucking scene. <laughs> so I was quite thrilled that I made it as well. <laughs> um, that was actually said was a bit upset, wasn't he? Yeah. yeah. I'm in it. Oh, fuck, I'm dead. Oh, hang on. No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm alive. Oh, um, I'm dead. And the, I mean, I was... I was quite nervous. The person I was most nervous about me was Michael Smiley because I, you know, rated him so highly um, when I saw him in Kimmel's and I, I sort of assumed it would be a very scary guy. Acting, you see. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually a very good actor. It's just, it's just, it's just a bomb shot. <laughs> yeah. um, but to improvise is quite nerve with somebody that. Well, A knows how to work with Ben, it's quite nerve wracking, but the, there is an element of improvisation, but usually the sort of the way we did it would be you do a take on, on the script, the text, 
And then Ben would let us do a, a, a more loose version, you know, where we'd forget the, the text for, for a second. And then we'd go back to it. And so you sort of take aspects or elements of the loose one and the, the exact one, and it, and it makes it more... It makes you more free as an actor, and it also is quite a good trick of making the actor feel like they're they're really like a genius, you know. <laughs> <laughs> None of them are, but it, it sort of loosen, it loosens you up, and then you go back to it, and it, and it sort of it make, it makes it more your own. Well, we, we shot on a lot of cameras, and um, the stuff with you and Enzo Svente, um back to the beginning where he goes. Uh, He's from Bradford, by the way. Two lads from Boston. I'm Bradford. <laughs> 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 but the, the line which is, what uh, what accent is that? And uh, oh, um, Austrian and all that bit. So basically, they, the, the two of them were quite far away from the action. We, the cameras were all by, there was a set of cameras that were by um, Charlto and the gun deal and all this kind of stuff. And you were set quite far back. And I, I've got monitors, but I can only monitor sound off a certain amount of cameras. So I, could, I was listening to the actual scripted stuff. But I chatted to the pair of them and said, I just want you to whinge and moan all the way through this stuff. I, you know, improvise that. And so I never, I never heard any of it for ages until I got into the edit. And then it was always, I did this, this two shot of them just going, blah, 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 moan, 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 moan. And heard it back and was like, fuck, there's some fucking really good lines in this. <laughs> and so, so, yeah, so that stuff was all pulled out. So that's the other end of it. It's like there was some... But actually, that, they were pure improvisational lines that were as, you know, thank you, Sam. I've got a question for Sam. How did it feel to uh, work with Killian Murphy after beating him out for uh, control all those years ago? <laughs> <laughs> I think that was my, I mean, they, said, they also said Jude Law was going to do it at the time. Uh, the only reason, we did joke about that one evening, but <laughs> Anton wanted someone that was a lot cheaper than Killian. <laughs> <laughs> and, and somebody no one had ever heard of. And um, uh, sadly for me, my band were less successful than we should have been. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, no, but I mean, you know, I remember watching uh, Killian in Twenty Eight Days Later, and he's, you know, I always, I was rated him um, very highly. Uh, so we, I mean, that, that was my one moment of sort of having one over on him. But he, we both knew what had really happened. <laughs> <laughs> I must say this is the fairest in terms of the spread of um, hands to have been picked. And usually it's right down the front, the first three rows get everything, all the back are just left. The yeah. cool people sit at the back though. Yeah, yeah. Always oh, yeah, after doing like 20, um, 20 of these, I've, I've seen the pattern. <laughs> Sorry, love. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, uh, really enjoyed that, by the way. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Um, I just wondered, actually, because that, uh, a lot of trailers these days give away so much, but when I saw a trailer for this, I was like, sold. It looked fantastic. I just wondered, like, you know, when you, you finish the edit, that kind of stuff, like, you know, like the trailers and the posts and that kind of stuff, is it, is it in your hands, or like, do they take it away from you, like, mark it, you know, differently than what you feel, or? They, they, they ask me, and, and I, I'm, I'm involved in it, but there's a couple of things going on. One is that if I chime up and go, I've got a really good idea for the poster and a really good idea for the trailer, and then the film doesn't make any money, that's my fault. Because <laughs> I've got a way of marketing people who do it every day, that's their fucking job, that's all they do. Um, and there's definitely a difference between a really good poster and a poster that gets people to go to the cinema, that's a they're two separate things. And that's why you end up with the posters with three big floaty heads. 
you know, because you know, you need to know, oh, do I like those actors? Yeah, I'll go and see that film rather than a lovely arty screen print poster that was. No, I'm not on the poster. That's exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> so there's that, and then the trailer side of it, I'm always, I look at these trailers and I go, fuck man, that's giving everything away, kind of. But at the other end of it, it's, it's better be the best bits that you show to lure people in to see it. And you only really get cross about trailer once you've seen the film and you know how much it's given away. Um, unless it's like a major, massive plot point. But I think in the free fire trailer, it's just like, bang, 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 ah, yeah, you know, lines, lines, lines. Um, there was a point when we, the, the, I think the American trailer, they showed a lot of individual characters getting killed. And so we made them take that out because we just thought that was just a, that was a step too far because you'd know. But I don't know. It depends on your relationship with the trailers as well. When you want, do you watch them and whether or not you I mean, because I try, try, try not to um, or whether you can even remember them no, I just watched the Alien Covenant trailer like about five times yesterday and I can see like he's dead she's dead you know like yeah but well, come on you know they're all dead in that <laughs> <laughs> it's just what order that's the only difference you know? it's going to be the one it's going to be the, the the woman uh, um, that doesn't get many lines at the beginning is going to be the one that is at the end, isn't it? In the same way that the original alien was. So, do you the same? Do you use the same people for the posters and stuff? Because they're always, there's always, they're always pretty cool compared with a lot of other. Well, I think we've well, even the last certainly high, the high rise posters were really ace, and the, yeah. um, and that was um, Premier, who's a, a design company that um, Studio Canal, the distributors, use a lot. Um, but I think what happened with both High Rise and Free Fire is that they were really excited about it and so they just did loads of them. And usually uh, on other films I've done it, you get f- an option of five and there's four really shit ones that so you're never going to pick, they just put in this filler and then the one that they want you to is probably printed slightly bigger. Than the other <laughs> but with High Rise they were all really good and then they all went out, they used them all. But I think there's a difference now as well because back in the day it would be just one poster and this. Oh, you know, it's got to be marketing all one thing. But now, because of the net, you can put out millions of posters, and people love posters, so the more the merrier. And then you've got the slightly shit one, maybe, that goes on the tube. Without me. You're without me. Are you quite small? (laughs) (laughs) The Japanese one's good. Up on the balcony. Hey, um, most of my questions have been asked already, but this is okay. Um, Ben. If there was an hour of me you could work in just for fun, what would it be? Yeah, what, what to work in? Any other medium. Oh, any, any other medium? Yeah. Well, I don't know about for fun, but I mean, I'd love to have been a cartoonist and drawn comics, but I'm just shit at it. Two comics for years here for that, I thought that would be fair. I just can't draw hands. <laughs> no, that was a killer. And it's similar to if you're in a band and you, you, re- you have to give up when you're at a certain age, you know you're going to get in bed with the guitar. I was the same with drawing, I kind of couldn't draw hands and couldn't draw feet, and all the faces were the same, so I, mean, I, was, I, was, I was doomed quite early on. And we'll have one just there. Uh, yeah, you there with the face. With <laughs> my face and hands. Uh, the question for both of you, who was the most fun on set? Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, Bobby Entwistle, the sound man, is the most fun. <laughs> <laughs> he, um, he's the heart and soul of every shoot I've ever done. And he's got a little coffee machine, so he'll make you a coffee in the, in the espresso. Um, but also he's ready with the hugs. He'll always give you a hug. He's a very good shit. Might be coming in class. No, but he gives you a, little, a very warm hug. And I've learnt, I was quite a difficult person in terms of hugs when I started out. Um, but Bobby and Michael Swine actually brought yes. me round to the world of the hug, the man hug, the heartfelt, cupping man hug. <laughs> <laughs> so, nothing bad. It's the best person to say. Um, we'll go. Centre. Oh, okay. I'm going to go centre. Just back around. Sorry, not you, the woman. Need to be more difficult. Hi. Um, are you doing anything at the minute now? Are you um, planning for another film, or are you working on something that you can tell us? Yeah, I mean, I'm sure. Tra- I'm. We're trying to put together a movie um, called Freak Shift, which is basically about women. 
uh, with shotguns fighting giant crabs. I know, yeah. So hopefully that will come together. Um, yeah, towards the end of the year, I think we're going to be doing the the second difficult remake of Wages of Fear, um, which um, I've been I've looked at the book and all the version, film versions and analysed it and realised that what they're missing is probably one more truck. <laughs> uh, we have an extra truck to make it look, make my unique vision of that, of that um, <laughs> beloved um, text. Um, and uh, yeah, there's all sorts of stuff lying around, but I'm not doing anything at the moment except for, for touring up and down with this. And we'll go to the gentleman since I'm perfectly doing it before. Massive plan. Uh, that was awesome. Um, a lot of directors do a thing where they kind of do like one for themselves and then one for the studios. Uh, you seem to do one for you, one for you, one for you, one for you. Um, <laughs> it's one for you though, really. <laughs> 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 I did. <laughs> I'll pay to see you, you know. Um, if you ever had like a big IP, um, do you think it's something that you'd be interested in doing or are you always just going to kind of do your own thing? Like, will we ever see Ben Weekly do Marvel? <laughs> yeah, well, he's with an elf in it to me or not. I mean, I, you know, I get asked it a lot and it is if it, you know, I'm, I'm, that I'm privy to any of this stuff or I have a choice over it, but they, they don't really ask me, so I don't know. But I, I think, you know, I think that the, as a, a filmmaker, I've always um, loved that kind of idea of Hollywood, uh, but it doesn't mean I would go, that's not the end game, you know, so I'd like to make a big movie like that, but um, that wouldn't be the, I wouldn't then sit there making other films like that, I'd like to jump about, you know, as much as possible. And as, as you, you know, all the films I've made have all been pretty different from each other, except for being set in a single location. I understand that, yeah. but uh, but generally they're kind of they're different enough genre wise. So um, yeah, I'd love, I'd love to do that. But you know, it's a tricky one because I think there's there's this thing about genre. So there's like the, you know the genre of the cowboy genre, the gangster genre, now the superhero genre, whatever. But there's also a genre of budget. And like a really ultra low budget movie is a very different experience from from, from a high budget, you know, massive studio picture in terms of um, you know how you control it and how how where you sit in the, as a director in the pyramid of, of, of control. And um, and I think you just have to go into it with your eyes open. So I know if I did something like that, I wouldn't be I wouldn't have as much control over it as one of these movies. Um, but I just have to suck it up, I guess. <laughs> And we'll go from Martin Valkyrie. That was amazing, it was a really great film. And I would like to ask if Tarantino had any influence on it because there's a very Pulp Fiction esque briefcase, that's what I mean, and Reservoir Dogs, obviously, with the whole, whole, whole scene is sort of similar to the end scene of Reservoir Dogs. I wonder if Tarantino was any influence on that. Um, it certainly is a movie that fits within the subgenre of warehouse-based crime film. It is certainly that. Um, that would be hard to deny. But, um, also, they have shoes, um, which is featured probably in most of Tarantino's movies. <laughs> <laughs> it's the firm who often doesn't have shoes. Um, so, it, yeah, there are things that are similar. Um, but, uh, you know, do we all stand on the shoulders of giants? You know, so it goes back to there's a lot of different movies that it kind of falls, it takes from. I mean, my main influence for this movie was more Evil Dead 2 and um, uh, the cartoons of Warner Brothers of uh, Tom and Jerry. Which I looked at more as an influence than. <laughs> yeah, well, in time, you know, there's, not, there's much more violent than this. Um, and I really, there was what I, 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 I did chicken out on one thing, which is that there wasn't going to be, I got the art department to source it, but when Charlotte Copley's firing through the wall and falls backwards and that stuff drops on his head, it was going to be a shelf which had all sorts of things on it. It a bowling ball and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but I had to chicken out, which is a shame. Um, so yeah, you know, obviously Tarantino's influence, but so is, um, Obviously, got Scorsese, who's an influence on Tarantino, and you know, Reservoir Dogs was nipped from um, City on Fire, as we all know, which was only made three years before it. So, you know, we're going to get into it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, we'll go towards the back. I uh, 
thought the uh, action action sequences were shot in really calm and cool and quite funny. I thought they were really, really thrilling. And I was wondering if that um, bright, slow pace book, specific style, was what you intended initially, or if it was something that came out in the edit? Were you shooting for that, or was it something that kind of the rhythm of the film kind of revealed that? Yeah, what I wanted was that kind of deliberate style that I don't think I got to it because it's really difficult, but that the James Cameron style, which is, I feel that the James Cameron style comes from the kind of Kurosawa style in um, uh, Seven Samurai of the, everything in its place and you, you wherever a character looks and they see something, you see the point of view and then it's like um, procedural in terms of the action. So <laughs> it would... That, there's that side and then there's the kind of the Tony Scott influenced Michael Bay cinema which is a bit more um, kind of image soup shot really 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 fast and jumping around all over the place you know so I was trying to go back to that kind of thing of um, the lots of point of view shots and lots of um, you kind of knew where everything came from that was the intention anyway so I'm going to have to start wrapping this up guys because there's loads of you and I won't pick around everyone so last question who's got a great great question <laughs> not a difficult question I don't get that confused we've <laughs> <laughs> got an actual question we've got an actual question we'll go for an actual question uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, my, my question is about rehearsal and blocking so as far as blocking goes and rehearsing that with the actors, how much did you have in mind beforehand as far as your maps and such? And how much did you react to what the actors did on set? Like which way around does it happen? Well, there's two things going on. One which is the first 30 minutes of the film, everyone are on their feet. Yeah. And then after that, they're on the ground. So the ability for just a physical ability for actors to nip about and balls up with blocking by moving around and changing their thing. They've got half an hour they can do that and afterwards they can't really, they can't suddenly have a monologue and then crawl off somewhere and crawl back. <laughs> so so I, was, I, I took back the control in terms of uh, what, what they could do. But I was you know, I encouraged the, 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 the kind of interpretation and stuff. I mean, what I get to generally do is storyboard a lot and then don't have the storyboards on set um, to allow for that kind of proper collaboration between me and, me and the actors. But when it comes to action, you can't really improvise action because people get their thumbs blown off or hurt uh, horribly or killed. So um, that side of stuff then has to be uh, very controlled. But you see how the film goes from like action to pause, action to pause. So the pause bits, again, then the performances coming in can be... That, um, how you know I want to work with the actors on that stuff, but but by this last two thirds of the movie, mostly they were just lying in corners, yeah. so couldn't um, move yeah. around too much. We used to do these amazing things out of well, it was at the end of every week when we do the whole. So we do we sort of get to a certain part of the story. There was one scene that was like scene fifteen. Scene fifteen. I, and we all got badges. I survived scene fifteen. <laughs> <laughs> where at the end of the week you sort of blocked out all these different parts of action. At the beginning we were always there the whole time and then table tennis starts upstairs at 3 o'clock. So. But then we do, they'd hide cameras at the far end of the room and they'd just fill our pockets with as much ammunition as possible and we'd reenact everything we'd done all week in one long sort of play, so you, it was almost like a gig or something, or a play, where we'd all have to remember what we'd done, and it was just, it, it was terrifying as well, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. But maybe like, 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 like a ten minute take at the end of the day, where we'd just, like, sh sh shoot one another. It was, it was pretty awesome, it was, it was very loud as well, wasn't it? Yeah. I mean, the irony of it was, is that it was all shot in the um, Argus print works, which is the, uh, the evening Argus is the Brighton local newspaper and they moved out of print works out to somewhere else but the offices of the Argus were at the back and um, we fired 7,000 rounds of ammunition blew all that shit up, had various people over from Hollywood and the Argus never came down to cover it <laughs> 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 
headlines during the time were um, Buddhists freeze lobster from restaurants. <laughs> <laughs> a woman loses child in long grass. <laughs> and all of these headlines that, you know, you, you were some of the sandwich boards in town, Ben's trailer was completely covered in all of the Argos headlines throughout yeah. <laughs> six weeks of shoot. Not one of them mentioning like Army or Bree being in town. Yeah. No one even banned an island. It was right next to an M&S. It was behind an M&S. There was like a sign outside. Uh, was it? Yeah. There's a sign outside saying, if you're in a gunfire, don't call the police. <laughs> <laughs> well, we used to dare each other to go in at lunch. <laughs> <laughs> completely fucked up. Go on, kill you. Go and buy a fucking pearl sandwich. Come on, pull it off. They still haven't reported on it. <laughs> Thank you so much, guys. You've been really fantastic. I don't know if you've got any closing words. Sam, we haven't really talked about the fact that you are a, a bit of a Leeds legend and it's a real pleasure to have you back here. Yes. Um, That's <laughs>